Welcome, I'm Carol Jenkins, Executive Director at Cystic Fibrosis Research Incorporated. We're here for our CFRI Annual General Membership Meeting. It's an opportunity for our community to reconnect, to conduct business, and to share information with CF experts. Through CFRI Live, we bring these presentations to those near and those far. Before beginning, I would like to note that no information presented tonight is intended for patients' diagnosis or treatment in any way. As always, we urge you to work together with your healthcare team for all your medical questions and for any further questions about travel. Tonight, we look forward to our presentation on traveling with cystic fibrosis. Thanks to Genentech for supporting this event the venue, the refreshments, the studio we have constructed here at Crown Plaza Cabana, and all other associated costs have been generously sponsored by Genentech. Tonight's program is being filled by David Suhu. I encourage all of you to ask questions, whether you are here in the audience or part of our online viewing community. Volunteer Eric Martin is handling the streaming portion of this production, and Anna Modlin is fielding questions from our viewers. And finally, thanks to our volunteers tonight. We have with us Sunita, Sam, and Chris for serving, helping with registration, and helping us with our cross-infection guidelines. Tonight, we have two speakers who know the ins and outs of traveling with cystic fibrosis. They are Annabelle Stenzel and Isabel Stenzel Burns, co-authors of a book many of us have read many times, a memoir called The Power of Two, which is now a film production as well. Both have CF and are double lung transplant recipients. Medal winners of the transplant games, ambassadors for cystic fibrosis and organ donation across the country, across the country and beyond to Japan and around the world, and an inspiration with all, uh, for us all. So I invite you to fasten your seatbelt, lock your tray tables, and welcome Annabelle and Isabel. Thank you. Good evening. This is Annabelle. And I'm Issa. So, so nice to see many familiar faces. Yes. Thank you for coming this evening. And for those of you who are live streaming, welcome. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, so we are going to be talking a mile a minute. Um, so fasten your seat belts for an amazing ride. Um, we are twins on steroids, so we talk fast. We have a lot to say. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that this is just not only our story, but we also polled a lot of other adults and, and youngsters with CF about their travel experiences in the making of this story, Some in this of whom film. Are in the room. Some of whom are in the room. So this is really acknowledging the input of many, many people. Um, first of all, why were we chosen? Um, well, we have a close affiliation with CFRI, near and dear to our hearts, and also we are avid, avid travelers. Um, we probably have the highest carbon footprint in this whole room for traveling. Um, so we, we have experience. Um, we are born and raised in an international family with a Japanese mother and a German father. So since birth, um, the only way to see many relatives was to travel. So we've been doing this our whole life. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more of the um, kind of a perspective of adults um, traveling mainly, but we'll try to throw in some things about kids, um, how to plan a trip, how to prepare packing, um, as well as what mode of transportation, where to stay, things like that. So first of all, why travel? Well, we all know that CF is a demanding disease, and we all need to seek out the best quality of life as possible. And traveling, frankly, is fun. Um, life is short, and there's a whole world out there. Um, I believe that the travel bug is the best bug to have, and it is contagious. Um, enjoying a trip, um, enjoy a trip without narcotics. I don't know, you put that together. What do you mean by that? <laughs> that means uh, some people with CF are used to getting narcotics. <laughs> so this is a fun way to travel and go on a trip. I don't know if she I get, know I don't I get mean. that. Do you get it? Do you get it? Yes, there you go. I guess being high on life? Yeah, I don't know. Traveling increases the life perspective, cultural awareness, appreciation of nature, and it's an opportunity to connect with others. Probably in more than half of our trips internationally, we have met other families with CF across the borders, and that is an incredible way to make our CF experience smaller by meeting other people in other parts of the world. 
Traveling is obviously more enjoyable and easier when your health is stable and when it's manageable. So the milder the CF, it's probably not as big of a deal as when it's more severe CF. I believe that, that when there is a will, there is a way. So even on oxygen, you can still travel and have a good time. And first of all, I live with the philosophy of I need to fulfill my bucket list, ASAP. Um, so what is on your bucket list and what do you want to do and see in life? These are some pictures we included. Um, enjoy a beautiful life. That was a sign we found in Japan. And then down here is a friend of ours, James, who, had, who has traveled amply. Um, this is uh, uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. You probably recognized this. So, we believe in fitting CF into life and not letting CF control us. Mm -hmm. Traveling with CF can be a challenge, but with ample preparation, good attitude, luck, and a few good tricks, it can be done. But remember, health is number one. A trip is no fun if you're not feeling well. Um, so it's important to make health priorities the, the first thing. Stay hydrated, eat well, try to get good sleep, even if you're dealing with jet lag. And most of all, stay compliant. I know it's very hard when you're full of distractions in a new place and you want to see so many things and do so much, it's easy to want to skip a treatment here or there, but if it means that you're not going to feel well and then you may not enjoy the rest of your trip, it may not worth be the price to pay. And that's our friend Eric in uh, Italy. So first of all, for planning a trip, sometimes the sky is the limit, sometimes it is not. The wallet's so, the limit. The, the wallet's the limit too. <laughs> So first of all, where? Do you want to go domestic in the U.S. or do you want to go internationally? Um, and is there a CF center near those places? Do you want to go remote, in other words, in, in a place that's there's nothing, or urban. Um, do you want to go to a place that has some risk? You know, pollution is a factor. What part of the country is, uh, what part, part of the world, developing or developed a world? Or is there infection risk? Is it a place like the tropics where there might be risks of infections, especially for those who are post-transplant where that's a bigger issue? And then is there access to electricity? Are we talking about something so remote like camping in the wilderness where there may not be? Um, or something more developed like uh, another country, is that electric voltage compatible with your machines? Um, and when? When do you want to go? Do you want to go in a good season where it's warm or in a cold season where it's much colder? Does that affect your health in terms of temperature, humidity? You know your body best and so it's important to think about that. Do you want to go to a wet place or a dry place? Are you planning a trip for the holidays where it might be flu season and is it important to think about flu shots and things like that, other vaccinations as well? Who are you going with? Are you going with people who are familiar with your CF? Or are you taking that first trip with that boyfriend? Or are you going that first trip with your friends from college and they don't quite know this whole CF production? Um, that plays a huge role in how much are you going to be yourself and be all out there with the cough attacks? Or are you going to find yourself kind of inhibiting yourself and, and holding that cough in? Or uh, how comfortable are you going to be with, with friends or family? And most importantly, how long? How long are you, can you handle being away from home and being away from the, your familiar medical care? What can your body handle? And again, I think the key thing is that people who travel have to know their bodies well, to know how long can you be away from your home? And what can you and your kids handle? You know, this is not only about adults who want to travel, but families as a whole. And what can kids handle in terms of not sleeping in their own bed, not having their usual uh, routine. routine of foods and so on. More pictures, just people traveling. This is my grandmother when we were younger traveling. And um, mode of transportation, it's really about planes, trains, or automobiles at this point. Um, also cruise ships. I believe that cruise ships are a fantastic way for people with CF to travel. You are planted in one convenient, small, compact room. You can leave all your medical stuff there. You can eat to your heart's content in CF style. Um, and I will be very surprised if there's not a CF or who doesn't gain weight on a cruise ship. Anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, and, you know, obviously planes, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Bicycles or even by foot are other ways that people who have milder CF may travel or people who are post-transplant. 
think about how do you want to travel? Do you want to travel independently with your family, just making your own itinerary? Or do you want to travel with a tour? Now, there are some cautions about tours because they are go, go, go from morning to night. And they can be quite exhausting, especially for someone with limited energy. Um, and so really think about what tour you can handle. And some people have even recommended to get a private tour guide, somebody who can accommodate to your physical needs. And then in terms of preparation, first of all, we always encourage people to check with their doctor about their travel plans, especially if they're freshly out of the hospital or if their health is a little bit less stable. Also, depending on where they're going, if they're going to high elevation or international or some exotic place, you might want to check with your doctor. Make sure that you get the green light from them. Make sure that all your prescriptions are filled, and we'll talk more about that and find out a CF center near your destination. We have never left our home without having a backup plan in case we get sick. And we always have the names of a CF physician or a CF center close to our destination, even if it means Norway or Spain or even Japan, even though they had limited knowledge. Schedule rest days before and after your trip. I think that is very important in considering the exhausting part of your journey. You want to have a good time, but you don't want to get so sick. So pace yourself before and after. Know your body, anticipate your needs. I kind of mentioned that already. And then think about your airway clearance. What is the most, um, most uh, practical? What is the most uh, productive for you? And could you live without something like the vest for a little bit if it will ease your travel experience? Some people say, oh, it's too heavy and bulky to carry the vest. I can survive on acapella for oh, a week. I can survive on my parents' percussion for a week and not bring that huge machine. I just want to mention we have some acronyms in the middle. Um, the way that we find out about CF centers is we have a book by um, Dr. Ornstein and it's called um, Cystic Fibrosis for Patients and Families. I think it's in the second or third edition now. And at the back of the book, there are um, addresses and phone numbers of all the CF centers worldwide. Um, and also CFWW is Cystic Fibrosis Worldwide. They have an awesome website that does, um, for the most part, have um, uh, information about CF clinics around the world and in all kinds of countries you would never even expect there to be a CF clinic but that's another great place to just jot that information down keep that phone number handy just in case so I'm going to now talk to packing and um, I just recognize that you know there's so much more to deal with when you have a, a child so um, this might all seem really overwhelming but Anna and I just want to emphasize that we have a blast traveling and we find it no big deal to prepare for travel trip for to prepare for trips and go on them but for this talk we basically wrote everything down that we need for our health and so to you all it might feel like oh is it worth it well we think it's worth it so bear bear that in mind so packing um, if Andrew was here my husband um, he would probably be smiling right now because he always makes fun of me that I spend three weeks before a trip packing and I get ready really early to prepare for what I need and write my lists and so on so I think writing a list early is very important because you realize what you need to buy and what you need to pack and what um, how many you know syringes you need and if you need to order them for medications also um, just start that list going so you can prepare um, I start hoarding meds early especially if it's a long trip I will maybe three months in advance order my meds um, three weeks after I ordered them in the past and then three weeks again and so I'm starting to collect a large amount um, if insurance permits and we did that for Japan we ordered four from four different pharmacies multiple times and somehow they didn't keep track um, it's not always possible <laughs> but that's how you can start hoarding and now you can get three months supply of medications and that helps when you're traveling so I um, always make sure we have luggage that has wheels on it or that can be put on a back like for a backpack so that we can you know minimize the effort in lugging all of this stuff around um, remember you may need to um, carry your stuff and I want to just emphasize if you get anything out of this talk for all the parents out there or all the adults out there the most important thing is to always hand carry your medication keep 
keep it on your body at all times because you can never, ever trust um, the airlines and, and the, the train stations and all of that. I hold it on to my body like my passport. I have to just inject here that I actually put it, it, like packets of meds in my pocket when I fly in case the plane crashes. I know I'll probably die anyways, but I think that if it is like some sort of airplane, uh, sorry, any, air, some sort of a water landing and I do get in a raft and I'm stranded somewhere, at least I have my meds with me in my pocket. <laughs> I think that's the least of your worries. <laughs> Um, this was a, um, a tip that was, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around here, a tip that was offered to us by one of our peers. Consider shipping stuff in advance. If you have a large amount of supplies like tube feeding material and, and um, even home IV stuff, it, it might be worthwhile to ship in advance. Um, oh, and our philosophy is that, you know, we don't need a curling iron and we don't need a hair dryer and, you know, obviously we don't do much here, but we, we don't care how we look when we travel. <laughs> and so our philosophy is that our suitcase is 60% full of medical equipment and 30% full of personal items um, and 10% food. Um, because food is just as important as medicine to us. And 30% personal, what I mean by that, and I'll be very blunt here, is that when I went to Japan for two weeks, I brought two pairs of underwear and a bag of laundry detergent and two shirts and two pants, one very easily washable, and really, really minimize what I have to carry because all this other stuff, part of my suitcase is filled with healthcare stuff. If you don't mind doing laundry every other day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and hanging it out in front of everyone to see. <laughs> um, and, okay, assess what you really need, what you really, really need, and we try to do that. Like, it's amazing how good it feels to leave your house with a suitcase and live off of that for a week or two weeks or four weeks and realize you don't really need all the other stuff. It's actually quite liberating. Um, and then um, I just want to say that when you're packing and you sort of have that light bulb, oh, yeah, I can't forget, um, Sally, here recommended putting what you need to bring on sticky notes and putting those on your mirrors and in the on front of the refrigerator to remind you for the day of to, to make sure you grab that stuff and go. I want to add one more thing too. I do what's called a head to toe assessment for packing. I start with the top of my head. What do I need? Shampoo hat. and hat and um, comb, hair bands, Contacts, glasses, toothbrush, sinus flushing stuff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, down to the bottom of your toes. So the head to toe assessment is something I do when I make my list of everything I need. So packing essentials. Okay, I mentioned this, how important it is to carry on all this stuff. It's not always feasible to carry this much stuff. But, um, you know, use your judgment of what's really important. I make sure that the medication is on my body, on, in the backpack I'm carrying on. Enzymes, insulin, inhaled meds, antibiotics, and laxatives. Um, yes, nebulizer and cleaning supplies. Um, I tend to bring, uh, you know, I actually, depending where I'm going, don't really bring um, extra soap. I use the soap, the liquid soap in the hotel, if they have that, to wash my nebs and I'll use the coffee pot to boil them um, so I don't have to bring my own cleaning materials. Or there's also those wonderful um, disposable, uh, oh yeah, I'll show that later, breast, breast pump cleaning bags that you get at Target and you can microwave your nebulizers and it takes five minutes and Anna Maudlin gets credit for that one, um, for teaching us that. So, and I just want to add that for medication, sometimes I bring extra medication. I do sometimes, I don't want to promote this, but I do sometimes use Ambien for jet lag, which is just because I have it. Um, and, you know, I ask for a prescription for Tamiflu if it's a winter trip um, and whatever other medications might be necessary. For example, I bring Cipro if I'm going to someplace tropical. Um, tropical, yep.
And I just want to mention, I'm jumping around here. Okay, I'll go back to the list. Um, yeah, Anna mentioned the airway clearance stuff that we need to bring. Um, as transplant recipients, we always have tons of hand gel, you know, antibacterial hand gel and masks, but not, maybe people with CF don't need that as much. Um, extra snacks, especially sugar snacks if you're a diabetic, a very important thing. The last thing you need in the middle of an airport checking your luggage in is a sugar low. Um, so very good to be prepared. Water bottle, I mentioned that because all of my CF friends that we asked um, about their travel advice told us water bottle is essential for hydration. Insulated bag for the palmozyme, that's, a, that's an, a, a no brainer that you have to take care of that. And then the emergency meds, going back to that. Um, I consider Miralax a m emergency med or whatever other product you use for constipation if you have that problem or if your child has that problem. And then cayenne pepper is something that, um, that my friend Eric recommended. And unfortunately, he has frequent hemoptysis, coughing up blood. And for him, cayenne pepper is his safety, that it stops the bleeding. Um, so I learned something from him. And salt. Um, I, we make sure we have extra salt for super, super hot climates, but also for um, putting into our water that we boil for our sinuses. And I would recommend if, you know, we'll talk about this later, but if you are staying at a hotel, it's always good to know where the ice machine is if you have regular hemoptysis because the ice machine ice is very, very helpful to stop bleeding. And our little disclaimer to protect CFRI, cayenne pepper and cold ice are not treatments verified by the FDA for the treatment of hemoptysis, and therefore we advise you to consult with your doctor on these speculative treatments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. She seems like she's married to a lawyer. <laughs> Um, so this is our hot pot. Um, I do travel with that regularly, but if it's too bulky, I will use, as I said, the coffee pot at a hotel. Um, and I boil my nebulizers in it, and that is the bag that I talked to you about. Uh, I can't quite read what it says, but it's a breast pump, breast feeding device steril sterilizer. And then here's a, the vest, one of the vests in a nice rolling suitcase. So it's very, very easy to manage that compared to what the vest was like 20 years ago. Another picture of the vest and um, lots of snacks, sugar, little jelly beans, make sure we have that. I do not like using a lot of bulky bottles, so I often keep my meds in a little tiny Ziploc. My, I'm sorry, my enzymes in a tiny Ziploc. Um, but my other meds, yes, depending, sometimes meds can't be exposed to light, and so um, it's not always good to use a clear, clear plastic bag. I just have to mention that this was a lovely Christmas gift from, um, to Anna from her brother-in-law. Um, it is an anywhere toilet kit. So can you use your imagination <laughs> and just imagine that, you know, when you got to go, you got to go. And so this is like, I don't know if you've ever used it, but I have not used it's it. very convenient. <laughs> yes, for and our And I adventures. do want to mention some of the snacks. The pink salmon is salmon pouch, uh, foil package. Uh, salmon, you can carry it on. It's high protein. It's quick to rip open and get a quick snack. Cheap, really cheap at Big Lots. Um, and also this little bag of jelly beans, great sugar source for lows when you hit a low when you're in the middle of nowhere. So, And then these are pictures from all of our friends and so on. Um, I guess we can say, back in my day, we had to lug around the 10-pound Pomo aids, the big heavy air compressors, and nowadays we have the tiny little um, e-flows, and that's very convenient. But it's still a lot to pack. And we actually save our vials from our, tobe, our uh, Callistin vials and pop them open and collect water from famous riverways where we travel. And we found that that is a great souvenir to collect from different places, and those Callistin bottles come in handy. You too can be obsessive compulsive. <laughs> okay, next. <laughs> okay, packing meds. Okay, of course, I talked about this already, how important it is to pack early. Um, this is a picture of Anna and I, Anna, when we were living in Japan for a year in 1994. 
Um, so we hoarded all of these meds and we kept them in the closet. And um, of course, you know, we needed a, a letter from um, the doctor uh, to show the customs people. And um, that was very helpful. And a little smile and cheerfulness kind of lets you pass through the customs very well. But um, we did have some problems as we spent a year in Japan. So my mother shipped overnight Pulmazyme. But she made a mistake and put the value on the label. It cost $1,000. And so that box was stuck in customs because we had to pay tax. So I highly dissuade anybody to write the real price on these meds if you ever end up having to ship them. So the whole Pulmazyme, it was all virtually ruined because it had been out of the fridge for a number of days. Um, and still used it, though. Yeah, well, we had no choice. <laughs> I do always keep a list um, in my wallet, and I know, you know, many people do that I know, um, of medications, just so we can just, you know, whip it out, literally, and show people if, if they ask for it. That's convenient in clinic anyway, but for travel, it's very helpful. And then um, I always make sure, and especially since September 11th, I always make sure that I have up to a week extra of medication, um, just because. And I also make sure I have a, a pack, a little, you know, bottle of the most critical ones. You know, for me, it would be steroid, you know, prednisone, um, Prograf, and Imuran, those three immune suppressions. And I do put that in my suitcase in a separate location than my carry-on, so that, God forbid, for whatever reason, if my carry-on disappears, at least I have two or three days in my suitcase. So various locations. Okay, air travel is just one way of, of traveling. Oh, I want to just mention also um, how important it is to, um, when you are packing, to bring the prescription labels or at least sort of the receipts from the pharmacy or some list, maybe even have the doctor type out the list. And you know how busy doctors are these days. So essentially, I will type out a Word document of what I want the doctor to say. These are my meds. These are my doses. I'm going for this length. I'm going to this country, blah, blah, blah. And I'll just email him that list, and he'll just print it out on letterhead and sign it to make his job or her job easier. I'll do the work for them. Um, so air travel, well, I think this is obvious for everyone to arrive early, especially these days. Um, but for CF, I think we need to ac acknowledge that we'll be stuck in the airport um, security line, showing all of our wares in our suitcase. So that just takes extra time. And I mean, this is so obvious, but we've encountered less experienced travelers who actually have large bottles of shampoo in their suitcases. So just a reminder that it's the three ounce limit. Um, we often, if we do travel, bring our saline for our sinuses rather than create it in the hotel. For a short trip, we'll bring it in a bottle. And they get, you know, the TSA people freak out about that. So we make sure we have a prescription label on the bottle, even for water, even for saline. And Anna got caught the other day the other time we traveled because the label was expired. So they're very, very strict about these labels, and it's amazing that they actually look so carefully. Um, so comfortable clothing. Uh, what do you want to say about that? Um, so we do not wear a bra. <laughs> In the airplane, um, especially when we had really bad lung disease, it was like wearing a rubber band. And when you're up in the air, it's about 5,000 feet pressure, and it's really hard to breathe. So I didn't need anything getting in the way of my breathing. So TMI, but that really worked for me. Um, I also get really bad gas <laughs> when I fly. This is against TMI. It's really bad GI problems. Um, and so I always wear loose-fitting clothing, like yoga pants or something that lets my belly expand as much as it wants. Right. Okay, and then bring your, we, we do bring a water bottle, pour the water out, go through security, fill the water bottle up. You know, that's sort of obvious, but um, make sure we're always having hydration. And Andrew knows that I, I grab onto my Nalgene water bottle more than anything else I own. Um, snacks, high pressure, I, Anna talked about that. And then, you know, it's really important to sort of Ex have an expectation of how long the flight will be. Um, when we used to go to Japan before our, when we had a CF before transplant, we would do a therapy at home, go to the airport, 
check in and prepare and then quickly go to the bathroom and do another aerosol because we had our machine on us and just so we could get that maximum albuterol effect for a couple you know six hours or so and then occasionally I remember doing a treatment in the God forbid the airplane bathroom um, just so I could get more albuterol to open up the airways so, and then um, I, I'll just say that you know I've never done this using a wheelchair except recently because I'm on crutches and it's really nice <laughs> <laughs> Also, if you have really bad GI problems like me, um, I often choose an aisle seat because I'm up and about so many times, especially with gas. Um, I want to go and let myself loose in the bathroom rather than to the person next to me. So um, that is another thing to think about. Where do you want to sit on the plane? Yeah. OK. We don't hold anything back. You yeah. Know. <laughs> you know. OK, next. Because we know we're not the only ones. <laughs> OK, now it's my turn. Um, so a little bit about car travel. That car travel is, did you want to say that one? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, let me just say one more thing. For packing, um, this is something that our friend Eric um, taught us, is that he does also boil water for his sinuses. But he has something called an immersion heater. He's a very experienced outdoors person. That you stick this device into water, and it boils the water. And that's how it cleans the water. Water. And he also wanted me to say that a squeeze bottle with a built-in carbon water filter can be purchased from Body Glove. It claimed to significantly reduce a number of waterborne pathogens and bacteria. I use this for drinking, but mostly to filter water for sinus rinses. I don't think it's sterile, but it's probably a lot closer than what the straight tap is. And this is especially important if you are going to less developed countries. So for many, they want to avoid the hassle of airplane travel and just get in a car and put your foot to the, metal, to the pedal. So uh, car travel is a very convenient way. It can be much easier for large families. Um, and it allows you to bring more stuff. And your back seat might end up looking like this, which is our back seat when we were on our cross-country road trip. It can be more relaxing. But if you have small children, it may not be that much more relaxing. Um, you can do treatments in the car thanks to good portable uh, machines that allow you to use the plug in the, um, the uh, cigarette lighter. Um, and you can also use oxygen in the car. Um, and it allows you to stop on the way if you want to stretch your legs, get exercise, stop at local gyms, whatever. That's what we um, learned from Peter Judge. Peter Judge. He drove that. across the country and had a YMCA membership, so he would stop at YMCAs on his on route to get his swim workout out. So we all learn from each other. I also just want to mention the O2 in the car, it's very convenient to have a strong husband or wife who can lift an 80 pound tank and put it into the car. So thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Um, car travel obviously has fewer germs because you're in your own little world. Um, it can be harder for children. And consider buying a portable nebulizer if you don't already have one. An AC adapter, which is pictured down here, that you plug into the plug, uh, cigarette lighter and it has a little um, plug that you can use for conventional plugs. Um, and then also there are now plug-in coolers, which is what we used on our road trip, where you can have the Pulmozyme in a cooler. It's plugged into the cigarette lighter and keeping cold for those 12-hour drive days. Just don't forget to pull it out and put it into your hotel room, because it will drain the battery. <laughs> Um, international travel, we've already mentioned a little bit. Um, keep your most important meds with you. We've said that already. I do want to mention that with the new uh, Transportation Security Administration TSA guidelines, you cannot bring melted ice packs. Your ice packs have to be frozen solid, or they will confiscate them. So that they get like gelatinous when they're not frozen, so keep that in mind. Also, when you travel internationally, consider the safety of where you're going. Is the water f uh, safe? Is the food safe? Um, is the environment? Are you going to get robbed? You know, if you have all your meds on you and you get mugged, where are your meds? So consider your environment, where you're going. Bring meds that you can't buy there. We had a very unfortunate story of a friend of ours with CF who went to Japan. And Japanese food is not very good with fiber. Um, and there's a lot of white rice and white noodles and mochi. So she got really blocked up. And there is no Miralax in Japan. And she suffered a long time with that. So keep in mind, if you're going international, bring everything you need. 
Um, and then we've already mentioned doctor's notes. <clears throat> Consider the electric voltage. We were in Germany when we were 10 years old, and back then we used an ultrasonic nebulizer. We plugged it into the German outlet, and it blew the fuse right away. That was a stupid thing to do, and I'm amazing that my physicist father didn't realize that. Um, that... <laughs> that it, we didn't have a machine for a good 10 days. Um, luckily, we were mild enough that we could get away with it, but consider getting a, a converter, an electric converter, when you travel. Um, and also, if possible, know someone who knows the language of the place you're going. If there's any a medical emergency, you have to be able to have someone tra um, translate. Um, the woman in J who went to Japan with CF um, she could not even say, I need constipation medication at the local pharmacy. How do you even say constipation? Hard to say. But luckily, they found a CF mom on Facebook in Japan and befriended her. And so they actually met her and desperately brought her to the local pharmacy and had her translate what they needed. So it all worked out. And again, these are some pictures of international travel. You can guess where the place on the left is. <laughs> the middle one is our Make-A-Wish to Buckingham Palace. And then the middle, the right one is Molly at the Galapagos with what you probably can't tell is a, a giant turtle. Oops, sorry. So these are just some pictures to show that people with CF have fabulous adventurous travel. We have Michelle up in the Tanzania and um, what was that, Kilimanjaro. Eric on a cruise ship with his girlfriend. Um, Alex in Nepal. James in the Arctic Circle in Finland. Lara and Isa in Mount Lassen. And then snow camping. Snow camping is a fabulous way to avoid crowds and avoid germs and avoid dust. <laughs> Highly recommend it. You don't need to bring an ice pack for your palm design. Yes. <laughs> Keep in mind, if you are an adventure traveler and you like to move about and exercise and go to high elevations, you may need to adjust your insulin if you are diabetic. Um, again, advise, get advice from your doctor. But truthfully, we've had many, many drops in our blood sugar when we're high up in elevation um, and also when we are active. So the whole diet and insulin thing has to be adjusted for us. So maximizing the health for your trip. Like I said earlier, health is number one. If you get sick, your trip is going to suck. Um, so try to stay healthy. Maybe consider a tune-up before you leave. Um, consider getting vaccinations or flu shots before you leave so you don't get sick. Like Isa said, we always bring Tamiflu as a backup. It's probably expired by now because we never used it. Um, beware of exhaustion. I always was so jealous that my, when we were traveling with my parents, we'd all come back at 9 o'clock at night from a day of sightseeing. They'd go straight to bed, and Issa and I would be doing treatments for two more hours. And then in the morning, you know, oh, let's leave at 8. Well, that meant Issa and I were up at 6 doing treatments. People with CF inevitably will get less sleep than non-CF people while traveling. And keep that in mind and pace yourself. Know your body. Know what you can handle. And try, try, try not to get sick. Um, eat. Eat well. Um, I think that one of the greatest joys of traveling for me is trying different foods from all over the world. Um, and these are some pictures of our smorgasbord of CF appetite, twins on steroids, like I said. Um, and drink plenty of fluids, um, especially in your, if you're in hot places. Good nutrition is really the fuel for your trip. Good high calories will make you feel stronger and better. Eat what your body can handle. And I am not really a good one to say this um, <laughs> because of my gut issues. But when I see a whole slop of ribs from the most famous barbecue joint in Austin, what am I supposed to do? Turn the other way? <laughs> So this is me enjoying a bunch of ribs, and you guys know where I was last week. Yeah, two weeks before getting a blockage that put her in the hospital. <laughs> um, this is one meal with me, my sister, and my, my, my mother. So three women ate that much, and we killed it all. Yeah. Um, this is like what you talk about, you know, dangerous, we call it intestinal suicide. It was in uh, Little Rock and we had fried oysters, fried uh, um, okra, fried hush puppies, fried catfish, and, um, and, and a pound of shrimp. Oh, and gumbo and grits. Now, doesn't that sound delicious? <laughs> That's why they make enzymes. Um, and then, of course, good old Japanese food, low calorie, super vegetable, like but good too. 
Um, so pay attention to your gut and medicate accordingly. I always bring extra enzymes. I always bring emergency laxatives. I put my Go Lightly in a Nalgene, the whole gallon of uh, you know powder. I put it in a uh, Go Lightly as a powder pack that and then if I need it then I will go to the store and get like a gallon of water and just add the powder and I just want to mention every trip I take in the summer I always pack Gatorade the powder just the powder so don't forget your routine many people get sick when they fall out of their routine so eat sleep exercise and treatments remember those are the four main things of CF it's just like wind fire earth and air for treatment for CF people. Sleep well, do your treatments no matter where you're at. Eat well, but not too well. Um, flush your, this is a picture on the left of Tom doing his sinus flushing and boiling his nebs in a campground. Exercise, we're doing push-ups on our hotel bed. And then of course doing treatments. So this, uh, Anna mentioned this, you know, you have to fit CF into life. And I, we have traveled, both of us have traveled on IVs. And of course, you know, you have to use your own judgment about how you feel and how sort of experienced you are with IVs of whether you need to cancel the trip or whether you want to push through and go somewhere on IVs. Um, and then for me, I carried about, um, I don't know, two weeks worth of those little intramates, little bottles um, filled with fluid that I could carry on with my regular carry on and because everything had a prescription label I was fine to go through TSA. So this is our star Molly who is on a cruise ship or a study abroad study at sea I think um, and she's doing her treatment. Takes a lot of guts to be so public and that's one of the things about travel. When we were six years old my mother forced us to go to a public bathroom and do our treatments and we were mortified because we were so embarrassed about it. But sometimes when you travel that's a priority. Doing the treatments even if other people are staring at you. Um, Anna doing IVs when she had a drip um, bag out the window. <laughs> yes, it looks a little funny on the, um, the I-80, but people do stare. But another thing is make sure you put like a sock over it so it doesn't, one, fly away, and two, get um, too much sun exposure. Um, our wonderful star Michelle there doing treatments while she's backpacking. And then um, here is like the quintessential do not do in the CF community, a treatment with your peer. But we're both post-transplant, we're just preventing infection. We don't have infection. So we're doing our nebs in the car. And then Anna doing IVs while um, snowshoeing. So. No refrigeration necessary. Yes. <laughs> So hotels, where to stay? I mean, of course, the tent is the most, you know, for those who are adventurers, the tent is the easiest and cheapest way to go. But we've had occasions where we had to do chest PT in a tent and people next to us in the campsite were screaming and yelling. Um, so it's important to recognize noise level and what you're willing to tolerate in terms of other people. Um, we've also had issues where regularly when we travel, if the phone ringing during a treatment and it's the concierge saying that the people on that floor are concerned because it sounds like someone is choking. <laughs> that was us. Um, we always love a free breakfast, Andrew knows that, um, because it's a buffet and also we can eat a lot in the morning and sometimes even bring some stuff in our pockets for lunch and um, it's free. And <laughs> refrigerate, you know, people with CF, I mean, I, I don't mean to make a joke out of this, but many of us are on a very tight budget, and so we want to maximize our buck for our trip. Um, so refrigeration in rooms, that's, that's key. Um, can you ship supplies there in advance? And then the key is no smoking. I do not recommend parts of Asia, uh, but that's uh, something that's becoming increasingly prevalent, a no smoking hotel. A private bathroom, is that possible? If you are low on funds, if doing a youth hostel or camping forces you to share a bathroom, are there, you know, is there a way to schedule your needs in less public times? How can I say that more discreetly? <laughs> 
Um, and if you're staying at a friend's or family's home, how, like Anna mentioned, how open are they with CF? I mean, do they have children? Do they have little children who might be full of, full of germs? Are you going to be sharing a bathroom with them? And do they understand what it really means to share a bathroom with someone with CF? Um, and all of those issues are things that we need to figure out beforehand. Oh, and then if you're staying with friends, like, do you have access to food? And sort of have a good communication with your hostess and hosts to make sure that that, you know, you can walk into the fridge in the middle of the night if you have a sugar low and so on. So I think that's key when we stay with people is just being very honest and open about what our needs are without being high maintenance. I just want to mention something we did in those hotels where people complained about us coughing is that we used a towel and every time we cough we would go... <coughs> we would cover our mouth with the towel, and of course much thicker than this, but it muffled the cough. And when we did CPT, which very, very few people do, we would wear gloves and do this with that, and then it would muffle the sound. So we did as much as we could to be conscientious of others when we were in hotels. And also during our travels when we were on a budget, we would bring, in a car trip, we would bring a bottle of Lysol. So when we did stay at these seedy cheap hotels, <laughs> we walk in armed and start spraying profusely. So that's just another way to not get sick. So what if you need oxygen? I just want to emphasize that just because you need oxygen doesn't mean that your life stops. And there are plenty of ways to enjoy life even with an oxygen tank. Um, but I do want to say there's lots of ways to prepare for traveling with oxygen. Nowadays you can actually purchase um, sort of something that looks like a suitcase. It's an air compressor or air um, oxygen concentrator that you can plug in in your, ho in your um, uh, airplane seat. and um, and also, you know, um, in cars and so on. But for us, what we usually did was rent oxygen or buy oxygen from the airline. We made a mistake. They don't allow you to bring your own oxygen right. on the airline. You have to purchase it's it a from concentrator them. Concentrator, you can bring sometimes if you have that. But yeah, you need a, a, a doctor's note. We did miss at least two flights, I recall, uh, because the people freak out about an oxygen concentrator. Um, so um, in 1997, we booked a flight to Florida. And then we called the airline to inquire about oxygen. And that particular airline, I will not give, well, I'll give names, US Air, <laughs> charged $500 for oxygen. Yeah, it deserves you to drop something. Um, but it was so expensive, and it was more than the price of the ticket. Um, but we needed oxygen. And so my advice would be to go through United, um, because they charge per leg. Um, to f inquire about fees, yes, that's better to say. These days, everything is changing. So, um, some some companies, some flight airlines charge total amount of travel on oxygen. Some do per leg. So, if you have a layover, you have to pay twice as much. So, it's a real ordeal. Um, and then check with your oxygen country. Do a uh, company? <laughs> do they have um, satellite offices all over the country? For example, with Apria, we would just call the location we were visiting and then have an address and ha a date, and they would deliver the oxygen beforehand. Um, oh, and I want to mention the first thing. I'm jumping around here. Ask your doctor if you need, if you are sort of borderline, you know, moderate to severe CF patient, and you're going to high altitude you know, flying even, um, you might want to ask for a, um, a high elevation PFT. And that's something where, and Kristen is here, so you can ask her afterwards uh, for more detail, where they put you in that little box for the oxygen uh, PFT machine um, room and let you breathe and measure your saturation um, and then decrease the amount of oxygen that they actually fill that little chamber with. Sounds fun, huh? <laughs> and so depending on your numbers, you get an idea of whether or not you need oxygen at high elevation or in the airplane. So it's a very safe way to just try it out before you're stuck at, in the airplane for a six-hour flight and start to have panic attacks. Um, oh, and Anna's pointing this out. When you do um, order oxygen, for your, if you have a, a national company, make sure you ask what type of oxygen do they offer at that destination. We went to Hawaii, and apparently on the big island, there's no liquid oxygen because of the volcanoes or some gas thing or something. So Anna had to carry these lovely tanks, which is just, you know, unfortunate, but that's what, that's the requirement over there. I couldn't hike on the lava. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Okay, and you know, obviously oxygen will slow the pace of your travel. And, uh, okay. So when to call it quits. Okay, that's truthfully like something that we all don't want to talk about, but we have to, that sometimes our CF does get in the way and we have to make sure that we can say, I, I can't or I need to go home. Um, and that means for us when we get really, really sick, um, probably not a good idea to wait too long. Um, when our luggage is lost and our meds are, are um, stolen or damaged, this happened to a friend of mine who went to Europe and packed her, her meds in her suitcase and her suitcase was stolen. So her three week long trip became three days, uh, which is such a waste. Um, and if you forget an essential medicine that you cannot acquire or you absolutely need. Um, if there's a health crisis, obviously like hemoptysis, a bowel obstruction, or pneumothorax, go to the emergency room as much as you hate that. I was in Japan when my port started to become very, very painful. And I could have waited a couple more months to take it out, but it was clear there was a problem. So there I was on an operating table in Japan, and they took a bottle, an open bottle of betadine with a paintbrush, and painted my chest to disinfect it and put the paintbrush back into that container. And I thought, oh God, what am I doing? But I had to, well, I assessed the situation and felt it was more necessary to take that risk. Um, but not, not always um, our choice, of course. For example, here we are hiking in the blizzard and we got lost. So we have to know when to say, I have to go back, I need to stop. Um, and it was one of my father's wonderful winter blizzard death marches. <laughs> That's when you know you need to go home. Yeah. Oh, I was referring to the picture on the left where Anna has a broken foot and a cast, and she covered her cast with um, plastic bags. And then you know you need to go home when you can no longer feel your foot. <laughs> So saving money, of course, you know, that's important for those of us who are fixed incomes and, and aren't able to work full time and so on. Bring your own snacks. Of course, we talked about this. Budget hotels. Um, take advantage of AAA, online discounts. We um, you know, ask, ask Anna Maudlin about all that, her coupon mm -hmm. frenzies. And then consider, I don't want to just say consider. I think for, depending on your stage of illness, um, I highly recommend um, purchasing a travel protection plan. Um, because you never know when you have to cancel a trip last minute and nowadays it's about, you know, it can range. I mean, we used to pay like 20 to 50 bucks for a travel protection and uh, it just gives me that, you know, um, safety of knowing that I can do a, a medevac and it's not going to bankrupt us if worse comes to worse. And remember I showed you those tuna pouches earlier, or the salmon pouches? What we do is we steal bread from the free breakfast, and then we make a sandwich for lunch, and therefore we're only paying for one meal a day, dinner. So again, if you need any tips on traveling economically, talk to us. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, moderately legit. So um, if you have a handicap placard, it comes in very handy when you're traveling, only if you need it. <laughs> okay, but not if you don't. Okay, so these are all of our inspirations, um, people who gave us tips for this talk. Um, Molly says, overall, I think traveling with CF is not as scary as it initially sounds. You just have to put some thought into it and dream big. She's quite the traveler. And then Michelle says, how lucky this generation is to have these treatment options. We cannot emphasize that enough. So. Sorry, we're running over. Um, so one more, few more slides. So most importantly, have a blast. Life is short. Life is sweet. CF, as we know, is a horrible disease. It's progressive. Grab onto life now. Enjoy and travel. This right upper, um, sorry, left, your, your left upper picture is the CF families in Japan that we met. The low, the right picture here is our CF friend in Spain that we met. There is a whole international community that we can reach out to. Just check on the cross-infection stuff. Middle of the picture, again, traveling in Japan, uh, camping and, and canoeing Row with, with rowboats. Uh, Alex in Nepal, a couple other people on the mountains. Live it up. Have a blast. But be safe, and we, that's the whole purpose of this talk, right? To be safe. But I just wanted to share these pictures. Our good friend Ronnie Sharp is doing a treatment in the airport. Um, Anna being hygienic in the middle of a campground, washing her hair. Um, and then um, Eric with his wonderful water bottle with the filter. So. 
And these are some resources. Um, the, the, what is this, CDC, something, Center disease Center control, Center. thank you, um, has a great website of travel advisories for international travel, where to go in terms of safety. CFF.org has a great list of all the CF um, centers around the world. TSA, traveling with medical conditions, they have a website uh, Transportation Security Administration with information on medical conditions and what you can do and not do. Um, Better Breathers tra has a travel guide, and I so regret that thing's been hanging around my house for 10 years, and of course, the day I need it, I can't find it. Um, but I have this it's great the book. American the American Lung Association of San Diego puts it out, and it's a 30-page booklet with all these things, and it's specifically for traveling with lung disease. Highly recommended. And of course, we have a wonderful travel um, guide within our, our travel agent within our community, Sally Best, who works at Travel Smith, who's both an experienced CF mom traveler as well as a travel guide or, or agent. So ask her if you have any questions. And then CF Worldwide, we mentioned. So lastly, we just want to acknowledge all the people that we emailed who sent us their photos, who sent us their advice. Um, and we are really a family that we learn from each other. And um, we wish there were more parents of younger kids because I think they could offer their own um, perspective as well, which is different from ours. But thank you for all of our CF friends who've shown us the way. And thank you for the opportunity to speak. Sorry we went over. <laughs> I think we'd miss an important opportunity if we didn't take some questions. And I'm curious, are there any people online who've asked questions that you'd like to share, Anna? A couple. Um, one of the questions was, are you allowed to board the plane early because of a medical condition? Could you repeat the question? The question was, can you board the airplane early because of a, your medical condition? And I think that's really individual. A person can choose whether or not they want to request special um, um, assistance. Um, when we were on oxygen and they had a tank waiting for us from the um, airline, yes, we boarded early to make sure that everything was set up and the flow was right and it was all, we had to be in certain seats that could fit the tank. So yes, we boarded early. I know people who do board who are wearing masks and they, you know, they feel that that's enough reason to board early to avoid this flood of crowded lines and so on. Um, it's really up to the person. Sometimes I feel like I don't want the special attention, what gives me the right to go first, and then other times I just feel like it would be nice. I just want to add, who would want to board early? <laughs> if they can help it and not, I would, I didn't because, you know, it's bad enough, it's a claustrophobic, germ-fested, stuffy place. I avoid it at the very last minute. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Another question is, do you wear masks, do you wear masks on the plane? Okay, the question was, do we wear masks on the plane? And I say yes, because we are post-transplant. Pre-transplant, um, for most of my experience, I did not wear masks um, because it was hard enough to breathe at high altitude and I felt the mask was more stuffy and suffocating. Um, but I do know that some people who I, some members of this community have taught me that you can buy like an ionizer and hang it over your neck I have no idea about the medical legitimacy of this, so ask your care providers, but it supposedly kills germs in this vicinity, so the air that you're breathing should be a little bit less germy, um, so that's helped some people. I, I do want to add also um, that there's been some hearsay reports out there that the water that's in some water in the plane contains E. coli. So we always bring our own water, which has been mentioned. And then the other point I know I wanted to bring is that, oh yeah, if it's a short flight, like two or three hours, I won't take my mask off at all. And even when they offer me a beverage, I'll say, I'll have apple juice with no ice, please. And I get a whole can closed and I store that for sugar lows later in my trip. So I don't even take my mask off to drink. Um, I drink analgene before. I, analgene is a four, four cup um, oh. container for those who don't know. Um, but I drink a whole analgene before I board the, the plane and then don't drink anything. Save my apple juice for sugar lows later and, and do that. So question in the audience. How many shoes? Um, how many shoes depends on the, where you're going and the occasion. For women, um, unfortunately, usually it means a pair of sneakers or walking shoes, um, a pair of uh, going out shoes, and occasionally flip-flops. Three. 
One more question online. Yeah, um, how are you concerned are you about uncirculated air? And you also touched on personal air filters, but there's a question about that. Yeah, I mean, again, we're post-transplant, so I, I want to keep that in mind that as a CF patient, generally you don't have to be as cautious as the um, as a pre-transplant CF patient, but we're very, very, very concerned about it. And um, I tend to have problems with assertiveness, but there have been times when I really want to ask to move my seat. And I learned from my CF friends that that's not too bad to ask. You can ask that. And Murphy's Law is that we are going to be sitting next to someone who's hacking away and then I keep my mask on and at one point I said would you like a mask to avoid the spread of germs um, but that didn't go over very well um, but yeah it's really um, terrifying I get a lot of anxiety when people around me are coughing and sneezing but thank God I do wear an N95 mask I do not wear the yellow paper masks because they were found to not be effective in blocking out germs whereas an N95 is a tuberculosis mask and it does generally prevent the spread of, of small particles. But it's harder to tolerate if you have lower lung function. Yeah. Um, I had a thought that I wanted to share, but I'm blanking out right now. Um, oh, crap. Uh, that's the, the air vent? You know, like oh, yeah, we turn our air vents off so we don't get blown with germs. Um, what is the other thing? Oh, actually, the, the mask thing, in, in this country, it's very unusual to have a mask on, so you get a lot of stares and unusual looks. I've had a um, stewardess once ask me if I had SARS, um, because I was wearing a Buddha shirt, and I'm Asian, and it was, you know, I was wearing a mask, and it was that time of the history where SARS was out, and I said, do you think I'll be traveling if I would, was, was having SARS? Um, but also, it's a great way for awareness. I go and explain the whole thing about transplant. People get very excited and moved. And there you go. You have a, uh, you've made your pitch for organ donation awareness. Can I just? How do you take the cayenne pepper should you need it? I suggest you befriend Eric Hyman on Facebook and ask him. <laughs> so Eric, if you're listening, thanks for the great tip. I think it's really, really good. But maybe you can share how people take it. Again, the FDA has not approved this, and you should talk to your doctor. We have a question. I just, I mean, not to be invasive or anything, I just wanted to know what kind of a transplant would a CF patient get? Right. We both receive double lung transplants. Yeah, sometimes you can get a liver transplant if you have CF, but most of us have double lung, which makes it even more dangerous to inhale anything in the airplane or crowded places. I mean, we've had situations, even buses or trains, that we would just wear a mask. Yeah, and yeah, we had one um, horrible experience in Japan in a um, an eight-hour bus ride when we had 50 or 40 percent lung capacity and it was smoking. The whole bus was covered, was filled with smoke. And so, you know, even if you go to a country you don't know the language, please learn how to say no smoking. Or please, can I, can, can people stop smoking? Because we were begging them in Japanese. Can you please ask people to stop smoking? They didn't care. But um, then we had occasional rest stops and got some fresh air. But it was really miserable. We have time for one more question. Any more questions? Wow. Well. Usually the N95 masks last for two to three hours. Christian, you can correct me on this one. Um, but being the cheap person that I am, I usually have it for more than that. But typically, um, you know, I pack at least one per leg of flight. Um, for five hours. Okay. For five, five hours. If it's a, a flight to Japan, two or three masks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let's give these speakers a round. For those of you online, I want to thank you for joining our CFRI annual general membership meeting. And we've been listening to Annabelle Stenzel and Isabel Stenzel Burns talking about how to fasten our seatbelts and get ready for really fun and safe travel. Our next event at CFRI will be our annual conference, which is held in Redwood Shores. It'll be the, uh, excuse me, it'll be held at Sofitel a three-day event where we can continue the listening and sharing with experts and meeting each other and growing our networks, followed by our annual retreat. 
So tune into our website, www.cfri.org, and thank you again for being here. We'll now break for our business meeting. <laughs>